Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to Strange Love Live Tech Edition. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. Hello. This week's guest is a man with many, many, many hats, although I don't think I've ever seen him wearing one. <laughs> Reed Beals. Normally, when we have someone come on the show for the tech edition, we have a specific thing that they're doing in mind. We've got like one event that they're that they're a part of, one t task that they're working on, and you're never working on one thing. No. Like, how many things are you working on? Several. Um, <laughs> if I stopped the count, it would probably frighten me, and then I'd have to stop working on one of them. So, what's the biggest project that you're working on right now? I'm um, doing a lot of stuff with Open Source Bridge right now, mm -hmm. um, putting together this conference in June, and let's just redesign the website for them, and am working on marketing and every other little bit that I can figure out to do. So you're the, not the last, but you're the first person that we've had on during the OS Bridge push to get things done, to get things ready. And I know that it's still really in the developmental phase because it's a few months off. And we're going to have Audrey and Selena on at some point. Yep. It's booked. I don't remember the date right now. Bad of me. But what can you tell us about the OS Bridge? Well, Open Source Bridge is a new developers conference that we're planning for Portland. It's in June, June 17th through 19th. And we're kind of trying to bring together developers from uh, different backgrounds and different languages and different kind of wide-reaching projects and give them a chance to interact and give them a chance to um, meet other developers that they wouldn't normally meet. And we're really excited about it and trying to get good talks and attendees and things like that. Um, the call for proposals is closing on the 31st. There's a minor rumor that it may be extended, um, but don't count on, don't that, count on that. So. Get your submissions in. So anything goes as long as it's open source. Yeah, anything goes as long as it's open source um, or relevant to the open source communities. It's um, so we're talking uh, the unlike other tr conferences where you have like your Ruby track and your Perl track and all of these language specific things. We're kind of stepping back and looking at disciplines and looking at um, open source as a discipline and mm -hmm. talking about kind of high level, this is the track for getting things done with this kind of software. This is the track for like deep down language internals and then branching out from there. We also have culture track talking about the fact that we're interacting with people and working with people to build this and um, our then some things on open source business and then kind of a hardware hacking, software hacking, getting things done by whatever means necessary track. So so on the culture track, it, it always comes back to this for me. Is that kind of a Portland thing? Because you've got the socialization of it, not just not just the technical aspect of it, not just what is happening and how you're going to get it done, but who's doing it and what those people are like. Is it? it it's part of that, and it's also a lot of like, you have, in some cases, thousands of people contributing to an open source project, mm -hmm. and making a group that large or even a tiny group work well together and figuring out like how to how to make things work well without crushing people mm -hmm. or driving them crazy or having them take over their lives, yeah, you know, things like that. I'm glad um, he wasn't looking at me while I did that. Okay, that'd be bad. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So let's, let's save some of the meat of the open source for the open source uh, episode we have. What's going on? What are you doing with Caligator? Caligator, um, it's a calendar aggregation platform for anyone who doesn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and Caligator... Can you tell us what that is without using the word aggregator? Okay, so you have a bunch of... <laughs> the original concept, you have a community. In this case, it was a the Portland Tech community. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to bring together all of these events that were happening. Um, we noticed the fact that there were a lot of user groups and they were all meeting and none of them knew about each other or they did but they didn't really ever communicate or 
go across these different borders. And so mm -hmm. we were kind of trying to figure out a way to make, get all these events together into one place um, so people could find them. And what it's kind of grown into is the fact that this same thing will work for any kind of a community if you have a seed of like a group of people who are willing to kind of step in and garden and farm things and mm -hmm. start bringing in events. You can kind of take this platform that we've built, this piece of software, and we're working to make this even easier, but just deploy a copy of it mm -hmm. and start saying, okay, this is Caligator for, um, I know there's somebody putting one up for tech events in Vancouver, BC. And it's like, this is uh, the calendar for this t type of events. People come add events and people can come and import things from other sites and add events directly to it. And it gives you kind of a one-stop place to find. What's going on? Um, yeah. yeah. So how did you get started? in the Portland tech community, not working with the technology, but dealing with all of the people that have made up this little knit group? Um, let's see, that's difficult. Um, probably part of, a lot of it was around the first bar camp. Um, I had gone to a bar camp in New York and came back and was like, this is exciting. Um, one of these should happen here. And oh look, there's a group of people who are planning it. So I kind of started going to the, um, at that point it was the bar camp planning monthly meetups, which didn't actually involve much planning and eventually evolved <laughs> into the Legion of Tech happy hour. Mm -hmm. They were at Jive and so met people, a lot of people through that. And then kind of at the first bar camp had a lot of good discussions and sort of coasted along for a while in and out of different user groups. And then I think really got more heavily involved last January when we started Caligator and thus ended up talking to lots and lots of groups. And now, you pretty much, I'm going to mix my metaphors. You have many hats. You have your fingers in whole bunches of Portland pies. Not the Portland pie off. I don't think you were at the Portland pie off. But. No, I, I couldn't. I think I was out of town during the pie off, and it was very sad. It's a very sad thing to be out of town for. Yeah. It was Portlandy, and there was pie. And I, I hope it happens again. I'm still reading the Portland planning. pie off blog. They're planning it. Yes. They're planning the 2009. I have no, that's the only information I have is that they're planning it. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So what else is going on in the tech life of Reed Beals? Um, I, oh, and before we go any further, yeah. you should tell everyone who you are on Twitter and where they can find your site. I am Reed A B on Twitter, R E I D A B, and my site is at reedbeals.com. Um, and let's see other things that I'm doing in tech. Um, a lot of the things have kind of been kind of taken a back burner because of bridge stuff and Caligator stuff over time. But um, one thing I'm kind of trying to do right now is get a lot of these little tiny personal projects that I had put off for months back up and running. So I'm trying to take a day or so a week when I can just kind of work on various smaller side projects. and You stuff. Yeah, stuff that I'm excited about and would like to see get greater community exposure, but... Currently, I'm just sitting on in some folder on my computer and haven't done anything with it for a while, so I'm just kind of trying to bring that out. Um, so what are some of those things? Uh, recently, I did the Tweet Scope thing, mm -hmm. which is a little tiny web app for aggregating streams of Twitter search results in a designed fashion. So the concept is take, pretty. take, <laughs> take a search term mm -hmm. and wrap it with kind of a pretty skin so or a skin that's relevant to the topic so get off my lawn so get off my lawn and after hours and things like that where that kind of started from um the after hours was the original one and i was just like i want to build this thing to track after hours because i want to learn about this new technology that i was playing with and then i think brom jokingly mentioned before long he'll launch bacon um, and so 20 minutes later, I threw up the bacon one, um, and then I kind of cobbled them along for a while and then recently pulled them all together into one project and mm -hmm. released it as an open source kind of toolkit for people to build similar things. You had a post on how to build one. Yes. I read it. I mm -hmm. still don't know how to build one. <laughs> it, it, admittedly, if you follow the step-by-step -step instructions, it will probably work, but mm -hmm. it's not the easiest solution at this point. I'm kind of toying with the idea of rewriting it all mm -hmm. so that it runs sort of entirely in the browser and pulls results in real time and doesn't require any of the server-side setup. But That would be very helpful for people like me. 
Yeah. You know, I enjoy the, the use of it, but not so much the playtime. I think we have a question. No, me too. I'm voting. For oh, it. you're oh, voting. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're Please voting. Do that. Okay. You yes. Go. Helpful people. I was going to say that uh, you released the source code on the uh, on Git, right? You've got yeah. your own GitHub, so yeah. I'm pulling up the screenshot of your GitHub site, which you can find at readbeals.com. There it is. And that's where you can uh, you can go and and pull down the source and set up uh, whatever. Is is it more than just a hashtag hashtagging or? Well, any search, is there more you can do with that? Any search result that you can... Well, what it's doing is it's basically pulling in RSS feeds or JSON feeds, I don't know which one I'm using right now, from the Twitter search site. So search.twitter.com. Anything that you can search for there, you could search for here. So, um, for example, you, we set them up for different um, events in the past. We used one at Cyborg Camp kind of day of and just had it refreshing every three minutes and just pulling in anything people were saying on a big screen. Um, so it's kind of <laughs> useful for that and for just hashtags and other, I don't know. Yeah, the folks at Cyborg Camp had a lot of fun with that uh, mm -hmm. when you pulled that up. So that was kind of your proof of concept when you, when you did that for Cyborg Camp? That was kind of the scrambling... Um, Amber said, we want this. And I said, okay, we'll try it. And discovered issues that I hadn't looked at before because I was looking at it on a very small, not very scalable method of pulling in data. And mm -hmm. they needed something that could actually update every three minutes. So They needed something kind of bigger than life in both yeah. performance and visually speaking. Yeah, so threw a few things together there and made it better. And then the code just kind of sat there for a few months Mm -hmm. until I had a t chance to kind of redo it. And the new version includes all of that, those improvements plus some other under the surface rewriting. So how many sites do you have set up on this? Um, we got uh, Electric Blanket, um, yes. which was around Snowpocalypse, right? Yes, Electric Blanket mm -hmm. was an interesting interesting thing. I don't know if you know about that. The um, It kind of started with a discussion we were having about blanket forts and how electric blanket forts would be even warmer than a normal <laughs> blanket fort. And um, after about 20 minutes of this pretty heavy discussion on Twitter between, I think it was like Nate and Amy and... Which few, Nate? Um, yeah, um, Natronics. Okay. And Stephen Walling and Amy and a few other people and I were having this discussion on Twitter. Someone mentioned the fact that we were mentioning this enough, we would probably start trending on Twitter if we started using a... Um, real hashtag mm -hmm. and so then by about 3 a.m by the time a lot of other tr twitter traffic had died down we were the number one search result on um or the number one trending topic on twitter Incredible. was electric blanket this hashtag and so someone else created the electric blanket twitter account which mm -hmm. also started discussing electric blankets and um then i created the site the next day to kind of say look there are things They're talking about blankets. electric blankets um, so then it all goes back to Twitter. How much of the Portland tech community do you think revolves around Twitter? I think. And then how much time do you spend on Twitter, do you think? So I honestly don't spend that much time there lately. I mean, use it, um, tools, um, tools have gotten better. I've been able to better filter the various streams and pick out the information that I actually um, care about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I think that definitely, especially in kind of the building of community and in the, um, building and maintaining sort of the relationships that you have that would otherwise just be like a passing acquaintance, mm -hmm. um, someone you meet at an event once and then never talk to again. Um, I think that Twitter allows for a lot of those acquaintances to continue. Yeah. And it's a very, it's very powerful in that way because you might've talked to someone once and we're really interested about the thing that they said, and otherwise you go home and forget about them, and here you can follow the progress on whatever they're working on. And I think that that's probably the biggest value I've gotten out of it is just... I think there's a funny flip side of that, too. We were at Beer and Blog tonight, and um, Tangare was sitting there, and she was looking at Verso. with So she was looking at her kind of curiously, and she was like, and I said, that's uh, Kelly, it's at Verso. She's like, oh, I know her. I mean, right. I don't know her, but I know her. Yeah. And I just thought that was really funny. And I think that's really a, another very common theme when you walk into a room and, and you 
meet someone that oh my gosh you already know that person yeah you've never met them but you know them mm -hmm. yeah they're there it's definitely an interesting media for that because i haven't seen other services that kind of let that happen on such a casual level correct um you can just kind of say okay i'm putting this stuff out here i don't care if you think it's boring <laughs> what i happened to be eating for lunch last mm -hmm. friday mm -hmm. but the fact that you do care and are following this That's sure nice. that gives us something in common yeah and it gives us like the stupid little details that might like better humanize someone and make them less just like oh this is this person who was trying to sell me their great new business idea it's more than that too i mean don't you do things over twitter you know talking about you know trying to find answers to technical questions and sending out links and that sort of thing yeah definitely um getting getting information out um twitter has been for open source bridge twitter has been like our number one referrer for a very for any time that we don't have like some big social news kind of hit any mm -hmm. if we're not getting traffic from something like reddit our top referrer will be twitter on any given day yeah um getting information out about causes and about things that you're interested in incredibly valuable in that regard mm -hmm. and you mentioned asking questions I don't find I tend to do as many technical questions over Twitter. I'll tend to like go to like the person I know who's I an do. expert there. Uh, but <laughs> questions like about the community, the like, mm -hmm. does the, the kind of thing where you don't need any particular technical knowledge to know this. It's like, do you know where I can find X in Portland? Mm -hmm. And the fact that you'll get three responses within 10 minutes is utterly amazing. I think it's, it's very comforting too, for some reason. It makes me feel like home mm -hmm. oh dr norval was making a motion towards the microphone i thought he was going to talk to us but but no. he's not he's no. not really interested i was making a motion to the beverage i understand mm. that i'm wor working very hard back here yes yes and we'll, we'll make sure i'm on camera at some point okay i'm going to bring out my little cheat sheet of paper cause oh really I have, okay oh, yeah i have i have information and i'm not afraid to use it but i couldn't i couldn't maintain all of the details in my head Wow. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the sites that you did some web design for. Okay. WhereCamp PDX, WordCamp Portland, Caligator, the Gregory James Quartet, and then there was a toy store, Pegasus? Unicorn. Unicorn. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Pegasus and Unicorn, they're just mashed in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what were you wondering? Um, I just wanted you to talk. I, I looked at them and, you know, they're nice. They're very cool. What do you do? What do you think about? What do you look for when you're doing a website? Um, when I'm doing design, I tend to kind of look first at um, kind of architecture and functionality and figuring out how best to arrange information and figuring out what the most important thing is and what people are going to want to get to first. Um, so kind of there's sort of a line there between so for something like Caligator where you're building what you're well, where what you're building is more like a piece of software it's a mm -hmm. service that people would use you kind of look first towards how do i get information to the user as quickly as possible in the chunks that they want while still giving them the ability to customize and drill down and other things um some th things like the wordcamp and the wearcamp site um the wearcamp site particularly i looked first towards pr presenting the branding of this unconference because that's something else that you do. You mm -hmm. work on people's branding. Yeah, I did the branding for WearCamp mm -hmm. and for Open Source Bridge mm -hmm. and for Unicorn as well. But mm -hmm. um, the with the WearCamp site, it was all about kind of getting the feel of this is this thing about location and mapping and sort of the merging of where these things have been and where they're going and what's next and kind of wanted to get that sense out there while still kind of without going towards like futuristic cliches of like we're talking about mm -hmm. the future which is kind of why i went with this map from i think 1812. i really like or that like it had the i think it had compass rose on there as well yeah and yeah. so that kind of process was like get this brand out and then kind of do a very simple um type layout for the blog and just kind of let it flow and let it everything else falls into place under that big mm -hmm. banner um, I, the recent thing I did with the bridge site was kind of 
about what is the conference. And I, I went to our front page one day and tried to point to someone and say, what's this conference about? And I realized that we really couldn't do that. And so restructuring that page to have like the one sentence and the five sentence description of what are you getting yourself into if you come and why you should be really excited about this. So that when people get there, they automatically get right. that on the site. Get, get the homepage and you get, here are like the five points that make us different from other conferences. Here is what we're doing. And hey, registration is only $175 until March 31st. Register now. Um, so it's What's like, it, what does it go up to? 250 I believe. And we also have a user group rate and a student rate. But um, that's, a, you know, if you're going to register, you should register soon. Yes. I'm just saying. Just saying. You should. It's true. What, Dr. Normal? Oh, yeah. They should. Sure. That's a price well, jump. And we'll talk more about that later. Yes, we will. I'm sorry. Yeah, on a later episode. So well, I, yeah, I, but by then the registration fee will have will been be out. higher. Then they'll make more money. That's um, true. So don't register. Yet. The um, <laughs> So your, your background is both as, because you're a photographer and a designer and a coder as well. You're kind of in between there. Many hats. I mean, you know, from your, your background, um, I think in school and some other things. I mean, how did you, how do, how do you go between like design and coding and, you know, thinking about design, but also thinking about coding? I mean, some people are, you know, in the code and they're not very good designers, right? And other people are designers, but aren't too technical in the code. I mean, what is it in your background or what gravitated you to both sides? Um, so I think, like, kind of my background was I'd been doing coding stuff of one sort or another for the web for several years before I went into college. And then through college, um, I jumped around through various majors in the first year and then ended up doing a communication design degree. So doing lots of graphic design stuff. And all through that time, I was paying the bills by writing code. So, um, kind of maintaining both of them through all of that. Uh, I think what kind of drew me to both of them is like the problem solving aspect mm -hmm. because in both cases, whether you're like writing code to do a specific task or taking a concept and expressing it visually, you're essentially given a problem and are finding a way to work through that. And I apply, I think, many of the same sort of logical principles to both of them. So that's um, so do you you started so you kind of were were so you were kind of doing the arts and the then the uh, creative but but really kind of also coding is your real real kind of job so to speak kind of your day job and your night job or and it all kind of blurred or it all kind of blurred well I mean a lot of the things that I'm interested in are like places where those two merge. Um, things like information design and information visualization and um, places where like doing usability studies and finding out if we lay this out this way, the users hate it and never click on this button. So we shouldn't do that. Um, so I kind of like looking at the intersection between the two mm -hmm. and kind of where that lays. But... I, re I really appreciate that too because I mean... <laughs> It's like, you know, you get somebody who just can code, you know, so well. It's nice so to have well, someone who's looking at the form and the function But, you know, then you, they really need someone to jump in there and, and work on the UI. And if you think about it, it's really the end user's experience starts with the UI, you know. I mean, how do you know how well um, that application runs if the UI is terrible, you know? Right. Especially on the web. <laughs> What's your favorite? I mean, it, are, are you... Do you think Apple is like the best UI design um, in the world, or what uh, is it? Microsoft? Is it? <laughs> uh, I don't think either of them are the best. Is that was like a world? Stephen Colbert Ubuntu, moment. It really you know? was. That yeah. was like a, the best or the very best. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No. I'm... What's an example of a great UI that you've run across? Okay. Um, one of the. I think the greatest UIs I've run across are the things that don't try to do very much um, and try to m make their function decently intuitive to the user. Um, there's a little like egg timer application that I use that uh, called Minotaur, I think, or Minotaur. I, and uh, what platform? It's a Mac application. Okay. And it, um, 
it basically just display it's kind of like a the window is a box with a thing that you can slide and as you slide this thing you are essentially setting this timer so it's exactly mm -hmm. how you would set like a physical kind of egg timer but it's a digital equivalent of it um and so you only end up seeing the center of this but it's like you have a window here and you as if you had a very long strip representing mm -hmm. zero to however long and you just kind of slide it to where you want to set it let go and it just moves along and you just see that section of it as it ticks That's down so cute. and it <laughs> it's like it does one thing and it does it very very well it doesn't try to run multiple timers at once it doesn't try to have alarms that go off at specific times it does timing for like my laundry will be done in 46 minutes set a timer go and it's like things like that where you have one piece of functionality and it's executed very very specifically um I definitely like things like that um I so think... is it something that that um something that makes sense and mimics the real world or the function of the real world i think in many cases yes um not necessarily that's not always the best solution but um finding a metaphor that will communicate to your users something that they already know can help to sort of allow them to use something more intuitively instead of having to be told it's immediately user friendly rather than having to look up the manual or search on the internet for how to use something you just look at it and you're like oh yeah i slide that so at the same time you're mentioning like um apple's ui design a minute ago the thing with that i've come across with that is it's very good for like its intended audience and as mm -hmm. soon as you step outside of its intended audience it may utterly confuse you um i when i was working on sponsor videos for ignite i was jumping back and forth between editing one thing in final cut so full like professional video editing suite which i'd had experience working with before and understood and yes it requires a lot of training but it does its job very well mm -hmm. and jumping to like iMovie, which confused the hell out of me because they were trying to make everything very, very easy. Mm -hmm. But in trying to make everything very, very easy, it's like once you've gotten beyond the threshold of easiness that it's trying to cater to, you are off the edge of this cliff. And... iMovie is very confusing to me. Um... <laughs> That's like a learned metaphor, though. It, it's like you, you try to recreate things that make sense in, in real space, mm -hmm. but then if you look at the history of the personal computer and what we've dealt with, for you know 30 20 30 years um you know it's the drop down and the f menu and the file and those are things that we've just are ingrained like yeah. you take somebody who's used computers for a long time like myself throw a totally new intuitive ui to someone who's never used a computer like something that you could give to your kids or something and start them on it's going to confuse me because I'm used to, well, where's that menu that I'm used to going to on the computer screen and, and all these, these, where's my trash can and, and my folders and all of these crazy things right. that are ingrained. Yeah. The, um, in some ways the, like one laptop per child's user interface, um, it's, uh, the system called sugar pentagram out of New York designed it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it was their New York office, but it was, um, it does a decent job of kind of bridging those things of saying, okay, you've never used a computer before. Here's how it works. And you have used a computer before. Well, you don't get a lot of those metaphors that you already had, but you get a few of them and you get just enough that you can use it to navigate. Um, but I think that that's a pretty important point. The fact that yes, you, there are things that if you have been using a computer for a certain length of time, you have learned and you'll you get you, set in your way you expect things to work a certain way this is something that i noticed about myself like i will make vast assumptions about how a certain user interface will work based mm -hmm. on other things and if it doesn't it feels wrong and it usually is kind of a situation where the developer or the designer of this application had to go out of their way to make it work in the non-standard way and it feels wrong yeah. um places where it's like I'm on a website, and I need to scroll down, but I can't actually scroll. I have to use this little arrow button that tells me I to hate scroll. That. It's like it makes you're me you're crazy. Yes, it's like you're breaking the, 
the expected pattern. And right. Don't try to be fancy just for the sake of it. Yeah. All right. Well, we're closing on the end of the tech episode, but I want to know what you think are three to five things for people to keep their eyes on in the Portland tech arena. Oh, oh that, that's difficult. Um, well, there's some interesting kind of new things that mm -hmm. I'm sort of very interested uh, by. Um, Jesse Hallett recently started the Portland JavaScript Admirers Group, which I think is awesome because JavaScript is such a maligned programming language and it deserves some respect. And I haven't been able to get to that many of their meetings, but I really think that that's an interesting thing. And um, it kind of was one of those points where um, he had emailed uh, a couple of people involved in Caligan and was like, okay, I want to start a user group. How would I do this? And didn't happen. So I think that's exciting. Um, I will put in yet another plug for Open Source Bridge. You should come. Um, you should submit proposals. It will be awesome. Um, and I think that the sort of, I think we've definitely reached a point where things are happening every day and we know this everyone likes to schedule events on wednesdays for some reason <laughs> um we had considered features in calligator to say are you sure you want to put that on oh, a wednesday please God. please um, do yeah <laughs> <laughs> or any day just like you know there are three events in portland this that would this be day. nice if that's when a, you scheduled something it popped up and said this this and this, that, or this. that's actually one of these like pipe dream features that we had thought of early mm -hmm. on in calligator which was the um, scheduling assistant sort of feature that says, okay. But we... don't make it like that obnoxious little paperclip. No, no, no. It, it, it's just like, <laughs> well, but the concept is because you can. Oh, bring back <laughs> Clippy. Bring back Clippy. I see you're scheduling an event. <laughs> I see you're scheduling an event. What do you know? <laughs> the concept here was actually like, you have entered an event and because you can give events tags, you could say, this is an event that deals with Ruby and beer. And, um, these are the other and events. And what events don't. Yes. And these are the other, <laughs> it's like, oh, wait. <laughs> warning either it would say warning this event conflicts with these three events that are tagged with ruby and these two events that are tagged with beer or um the alternate version would be like i want to schedule an event about ruby and beer show me a list of nights where that don't have any collisions so you could just go there initially and say do this 2012. so that'll probably happen at some point that would be nice that would be really 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 yes. nice we would be happy for april 1st Yes. Oh, yes. We also had the uh, special version of Caligator for uh, April Fool's Day that we were considering, which was the verbally abusive Caligator. And it would be like, yes. um, yeah. you tried to schedule an event on Wednesday. What are you thinking, <laughs> What's idiot? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and, um, oh, I'm sorry. This is abuse. Yeah. So definitely. Were those your three? Did you get three? Did I get three? I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's like, yeah, we, we've yeah. gotten to a point where we have a whole bunch of stuff going on. Yeah. And... There, there's really, um, it's not just one community. It's a lot of little communities Correct. and they're intertwined and talking to each other. And that's good. Mm -hmm. Um, especially the communication kind of between groups that we've been able to come up with in many cases, like the, um, coders, social and other kind of cross user group events, mm -hmm. um, as well as some of the larger like Legion of tech type ignite events, um, are something that I think we have managed decently well that other cities haven't um i did some research into kind of user groups in new york over the last um little bit because i took a trip there mm -hmm. and the there were a couple of groups that seemed to be talking to each other and a lot of groups that seemed to be like we have a closed mailing list and mm -hmm. you can request access yeah. um so openness and communication between these different communities very cool okay well, Reed, thank you so much for coming to continue this discussion in After Hours. Please join us next week when we have Brad from Web Visions on to talk about that conference. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>